Hello, this is a production from the technology training team. We're so grateful that you're here with us while you're viewing the recording for strategies for synchronous learning. While you're here, we hope to provide some tips and to replicate what coherent instructional activities look like where students are engaged in synchronous learning. Now, ordinarily, you would, while you're live with your students, share your lesson link in Google Classroom. You would be very specific and methodical about how you set up your Google Classroom so students are very clear about where to go to click on their lessons. Here's a sample of what a Google Classroom and Classwork page could look like with that in mind. However, since today we're not actually joining via Google Classroom, you are simply watching a video and I'll share some additional information about how you can access the interactive elements within. I'd like to point out that the components for the framework for teaching are listed for you in front of you on the screen. What you'll need for success while you're watching this video would be the use of Google Chrome as your browser. As I mentioned, right now I'm going through a self-paced lesson in Nearpod that you also have the option to use. We recommend that you use Google Chrome as your browser if that's something that you choose to do. You might want to use some headphones as well because we do have a video to show you. It might be helpful to hear it through headphones. If you'd like to take notes with pen and paper, you have that option, but I also want to point out that Nearpod has an electronic notebook. So right here on this page of my self-paced lesson, you'll notice that I have an icon in the top right corner of my screen that looks very similar to the one I have here on screen. So that is actually access to your electronic notebook in your Nearpod. When you click on it, it may first prompt you to either log into your email, save your notes to Google Drive, or save them to OneDrive. So you really have the option of how you'd like to get a copy of these notes for your later viewing. Once you make your selection, you're able to see a thumbnail view of each of the slides, and then you have a space at the bottom for which you would take your notes. So that's an option for you as well. Now, I mentioned that I am viewing a self-paced Nearpod lesson where you do have access to the link. However, if you don't have the link in front of you at this moment, you can go to join.nearpod.com and enter the code. Now, this would be different than what you would do with your students. Typically, as I mentioned earlier, you're setting up your synchronous lessons in Google Classroom. If you happen to use Nearpod as a tool that you use for your synchronous lessons, you have two options in which to share your students' lessons. So you have the, the option here to share a link to your Nearpod lesson, which if, again, you could post in your classroom. Students would click on, write their name, and go directly into your lesson. Or you also have the option to share directly to Google Classroom. Using that option would open up a window. You're able to choose your specific classroom from a list, and you'd be able to share your lesson. So before we really get started, I have a question for you. I want to know how you're feeling out there. Distance learning has been very new for all of us, but hopefully you're feeling excited about this experience as I am. So as we get started, we know that it's super important to connect with your students and to set the tone and provide a greeting with them, especially for live learning. If you're in Nearpod, you should have the ability to play a video on your students' devices directly. For the today's purposes of the recording, we're going to play it here and just watch a few minutes of it with us. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, small humans. It is, gosh, what day is it? Let me check. Just wanted to say good morning. Let you guys know again that we really miss y'all. Can you give me an elbow greeting? Good morning, Elliot. I'm excited to see you. It's kind of cold and I'm outside because I need fresh air. I'm sporting my uh, soon to be six year old daughter's um, frozen uh, headphones. I miss seeing your happy faces today. I hope that you're enjoying a day that you get to stay at home and use your computer to do school. I know things have been a little like a roller coaster ride with ups and downs lately. I know that this is not like regular school, right? Feel free to do school in your jammies, I guess. That's basically the whole advantage to you learning. 
It's PJ day, so I'm in my jammies. I hope you are too. And with me today is Thomas O'Malley. Today we have some really fun and exciting activities for you. Isn't that right, Spike? Some of our friends from the classroom also really miss you guys. So let me show you. Yep, our reading buddies. Oh, she's funny about stuff because she miss you. But you know what? Maybe they want to come back soon. I promise you. All right, so that was a cute little video that shows how some of the teachers have decided to make connections to learning with their students. I hope you've given some thought, I'm sure you have, um, about how that might look for you as you are setting the tone and greeting your students for live lessons. So we hope to hear your responses when you go back and join the self-paced session. So some of the things we want you to think about as we're thinking about the components of a live lesson are in front of you. You think about um, planning and what exactly you're planning for as you're planning for your live lessons. How will you engage your students during these lessons? What will collaboration look like? Is it even possible? And how are you gonna check for understanding? So as we move throughout today's session, we're gonna unpack each of them to give you a few tips and to give you some examples of how this might look during synchronous learning. So first of all, let's make sure that we're all on the same page as it relates to synchronous learning. For example, we have to think about when planning, we have to think about the content, of course, which if you will get your content from the curriculum documents and the curriculum framework and the bridge plan and all the information that the academics, the Office of Academics has provided to you. And then what strategies or what pedagogy are you going to use in order to ensure that your students are learning? Those are the things you're thinking about as you're planning. You're thinking about your assessment as well. You're thinking about what needs to be done asynchronously versus synchronously. And I've said those words a few times. So again, in a few seconds, we're going to make sure that we're all on the same page and understanding those definitions. Now, just a tip, asynchronous happens without you. Synchronous happens with you in a nutshell. So you're live one-on-one. -on -one. And realistically, if this were a lesson and I actually had students in front of me, this video that I'm now showing you, this part of my lesson, what quote unquote we'll call lecture, really could have been a pre-recorded video. So I could have sent this out to my students in advance and then use my time with them, my live synchronous learning time, to do more deeper understanding and more checks for understanding with their learning. So again, what do you know about synchronous versus asynchronous? Here's a quick question, a quick quiz question that appears in Nearpod. So what element best defines synchronous learning? Is it real-time face-to-face interaction between the teacher and students? Is it online without real-time interaction? Is it pre-recorded videos? I'm sure you already know. The answer is A, all right? So keep that in mind that during this time, we are focused on that real-time face-to-face interaction that you have between you as a teacher as well as a student. Now, if you're following this video recording, you may get this response. Feel free to submit your answer or you can review it and give you an opportunity to answer again. I'm just going to submit anyway since it's a recording. So now, MSDE has given us some guidance around the definitions for synchronous versus asynchronous. I'll let you take the time to read it on the screen, but once again, I'm pointing out that synchronous is real-time interaction between the teacher and the student. It could take place virtually. It could take place um, at home while students are accessing a web conference. That would be synchronous. It's real-time. Asynchronous is online without real-time interaction. So again, it could be pre-recorded videos, lessons, resource videos, assigned readings, and so much more. Now, the interesting thing to think about when you're thinking about um, synchronous learning and planning is that you really can't plan one without the other. Even though we're focused on synchronous learning today, you still have to think about what your students are doing asynchronously while they're not with you. You'll get a few of those tips as we're moving throughout the day. But when they're with you real time and they're synchronous with you, you have to think about the engagement part as well. So what exactly are you going to do to engage with your students while you're with them? Clearly you're teaching them a lesson, but you want them to stay as committed to the experience as they possibly can. 
So if the student is, is an, a passive experience and that level of engagement, they're probably not paying as much of attention because the teacher might just be lecturing during the video conference while the students are being expected to just listen. When it's more interactive, the teacher might give the student a little bit more choice. For example, they might have a video to watch with some type of guided questioning that they respond to or note taking that they're responding to. Or there could be a simulation that they do online. It might be some virtual use of manipulatives in some way. And to the extent possible, it's important to give them choice and the materials and how they share their learning. At the creative space, which is kind of the optimal level of engagement as we see with the, the use of technology, the teacher is realistically the facilitator of learning and the student is more the one who's engaged with questions or they might have a project or a problem to solve or they may be sharing among one another and coming up with their own understanding when we're thinking about the creative space. So let's take a look at a few examples of what that could look like. So with sample one, um, and this sample was taken from the RELA fourth quarter, fourth grade bridging into fifth grade, week one document. And this is part of the first four days. For those fifth grade teachers who are familiar, you know that Captain Arsenio Adventures and Misadventures in Flight is all about um, a selection where Captain Arsenio was really interested in trying to learn how to fly. He had some previous experience as lots of different things like a blacksmith, so forth and so on. But what could that lesson look like with technology while students are at the passive level, the interactive level, or the creative level? So you'll notice that you have links here for three different samples that you can access when you're viewing the actual presentation that will accompany this recording or your, um, your self-paced Nearpod lesson. So let's take a look at this passive one first. So at the passive level, now this happens to be a template, so you could actually click use template if you wanted to, but at the passive level, um, it could be that the students with the teacher doing most of the heavy lifting, that the students could have built, let's say, a vision board for um, Captain Arsenio. So maybe the students were simply telling the teacher what exactly could be included on a vision board for Captain Arsenio. So here's an example of one that the, the teacher could use. Now, this might be beneficial in helping students understand a vision board, but this does not really get to the standard and the goal of the student doing their vision board. So while this is important for, for um, prior knowledge and activating prior knowledge for students, it's really not meeting the goal and the students are more passive in this example. In a more interactive sample, you might have, and this again is a template that when you see it, you'll be able to go to file, make a copy. But in this interactive example, the students are now being prompted. So maybe this is the next level of, of the lesson or the activity. The students are being prompted to create their own, um, their own vision board. So when you get this particular sample, your view will look very a little bit different from mine since I'm an editor, but you'll be able to go to file and make your own copy and have access to this. And when you share it with your students, you would share it so that each have their own, um, their own copy in Google Classroom. So what they could do here is on slide two, they could actually build their own vision board. So um, in this example, there are a couple of different images that students could use to help them build their vision boards. There's some directions that help them with how to add text. Um, they can add their own images as well, which is what's referenced here, but the students are actually building and designing their own um, vision boards. Now, what's also interesting, that this is the beginning of the school year, so you might need to, to offer more support, but you do have students who will come to you with different levels of learning and understanding. So they could realistically choose their own tool it doesn't have to be a Google Slide. They could choose their own tool and build their vision board. Um, so give them some trust as long as you set the expectations for their learning. Now at the creative space, what could that look like? Now that's a little bit different. Here I'm using Padlet. In this example, we're prompting the students to have already built their vision boards, right? And they've um, used the, the post here to add their vision boards to the post. But what's really cool about this 
is that the students can reply to one another. So you can see that in my example, I've given um, an example of a vision board. And then um, one of my students will say has replied to my vision board. So then they're getting an opportunity to collaborate with one another. And as the year progresses and they feel more comfortable, it's important to kind of think about sharing outside of their classroom space. Could they share with another grade level? Could they share with a larger school audience? Could they share with their parent community? So getting that feedback from um, other places is also important, which of course can be done with Padlet or Flipgrid. I want to note um, that Flipgrid technically sh should be used by students who are 13 and older. However, you will get guidance around an opt out for um, this option as we begin this year of distance learning. So the one important thing that we want you to remember is that when using technology, um, and engaging with technology. You don't have to throw all the tools in one lesson all at one time. Sometimes less is more. So you have to think through the logistics of how you're going to manage those different tools. For example, right now you're viewing Nearpod. If you have a student click on a link, it might open in another, in another window. So thinking about and addressing the time to give students to learn how to do those navigation pieces is important with Nearpod. Choose just a few tools that you want students and parents to get to know well. Um, and then think about what happens when something goes wrong. If something goes wrong with the technology, what is going to happen? Some of us are nervous. We aren't as tech savvy as others. So do you have reliable students who you could still rely on during distance learning? You could consider perhaps um, setting up your tech club and having students who are more adept at technology with you being present I'm helping other students who are having some challenges with different technology pieces. So please consider relying on that as an option too when you're having technical difficulties. All right, so here's another opportunity. We talked about the fact that it's important to think about um, the goal in mind as opposed to choosing the actual activity or the technology. As you can see, my goal was the vision board and then I selected tools that might give my students the option to create a vision board. So you think about the goal first and then what activity might match that. So here, when you have an opportunity to actually use the interactive Nearpod self-paced lesson, it's time to match the goal with the activity. So for example, if I want to drag and drop for my students to show understanding, which activity might best match that? Hmm, I wonder. Could it be Jamboard? Nope. Could it be Screencastify? Probably not. Could it be um, a Google Drawing and Slides template where every student gets their own copy? So you can see how that match takes place. All right, so right now we're using Nearpod as our learning tool. We're not teaching Nearpod today, but we want to point out that we've had you on one tool the entire time with the exception of the different samples. It has some interactive features that you could rely on. And while this training is not really about Nearpod, we wanted to highlight that so far, you've been able to interact when you go back and watch the self-paced or experience the self-paced activity. You've had an opportunity to interact with open-ended questions, with a poll, with a quiz, with matching pairs, as well as a video. So you have all these options to help your synchronous learning experience be more interactive. So this is one option for you, but there are plenty of others. So think about that and think about the features of Nearpod. So next, we're thinking about collaboration. That is the third component that we're going to consider when thinking about synchronous learning. So collaboration could take place between the teacher and the student. It could take place between two groups of students where the teacher might be meeting with a specific group of students to have conversation while others are off doing their own asynchronous learning. Or you could have students who are kind of doing their own work and the teacher is moving between two groups 
that are doing their work independently. And that's actually going to be an example that you'll be able to see today and exactly what that looks like. Um, depending on the schedule, you might think about doing any of these models, particularly this one. Perhaps you might meet with group one on the first day while the other students are off doing their asynchronous learning. Um, this group you may meet with on the second day. So of course, you might think differently about how you're gonna use your schedule so that you can maximize the use of your synchronous time with your group. Um, you might also consider how to differentiate the needs of your audiences. For example, if you have students with differing learning needs about a particular topic, you might have your ESOL um, teacher, your co especially a co-teacher, or your paraprofessional who can provide the instructional support to meet with students in a, another Zoom breakout group while you're meeting with other students in a main group. It's important to remember that you are not going to send your students to a breakout room by themselves um, because that's essentially like you sending them back to the classroom without your help. So thinking about that as you're planning for your synchronous learning. All right, the last component that we're addressing is checking for understanding. What exactly could that look like and what does that look like during synchronous learning? So, of course, you're gonna take advantage of your video conferencing features that you have. For example, if you have chat, you can always ask a question for students to respond to in chat. They could add an emoticon in chat or a number in chat to let you know exactly how they're feeling. They could raise their hand. They could, you could participate in polls or other participation tools within the particular tool that you're using, whether it's Zoom or Google Meet. Third party tools, I've shown you some things that Nearpod can do to check for understanding. And that of course is something you're doing throughout your lesson. You could also use Google Forms, Google Forms quizzes. You can set up your quiz. Some questions can be self um, graded. Care Deck is an option as well as Smart Learning Suite Online, again, Today is not really about the tools of setting the stage for synchronous learning as we progress into the school year. And if you take a look at our website, you'll see different resources that um, you can use to help with your own self-paced learning. Like I said before, you can't plan synchronous without thinking about asynchronous learning. So what does that look like? What are students gonna be doing on their own? What kind of project-based activity could they do? As you explore different lesson design models, you might consider, um, again, flipped learning or hyperdocs or different options to help with self-paced interactive lessons, or of course, pre-recorded activities. The tip that we have is making sure that technology isn't the barrier um, for students, for them to check for understanding. For example, you don't wanna put a PDF document in classroom and then, um, not really understand why students don't understand a lesson because realistically a student can't edit your PDF. So make sure that the technology itself isn't a barrier to checking for understanding. You might have to look at it as a student yourself to make sure that your students can actually interact with whatever um, assessment or check for understanding tool that you're using. Earlier, you saw some examples of types of collaborative groups. We are going to complete a collaborative activity in which the students are working in small groups during the live lesson and the teacher is acting as the facilitator as the groups are working. For this activity, each group is going to share ideas for one of the components of synchronous learning discussed during the presentation. Then read and reflect on the ideas of other group members. Lastly, they will record their biggest takeaway in the note-taking document or on a piece of paper. Our groups are organized by last names. However, we could have arranged our groups based on reading level or flexible groupings to meet a need. As the teacher during the live lesson, I would have each of these links already open on my device so I can quickly jump into each one and see how the students are progressing. Let's take a quick look at each one of the activities. Our first group is focusing on engagement. They are using Nearpod Collaborate to add ideas to a board. So you'll notice our Nearpod Collaborate board. They can post an idea, 
and then they'll be able to see other people's posts once they are in there. If I look at the next group, our second group is focused on collaboration. And they are using a Padlet activity to do a similar task of adding ideas to a board. Lastly, our last group is checking for understanding and that is their focus. And they are using a Google Doc to add their name and idea in the table. At the conclusion of the activity, as the students are working and I have popped in and looked at each group and provided feedback, I want to make sure that I call them all back to our video conferencing screen. I might do that by signaling the students in chat or just verbally asking them to return after I've checked in with each group. Once the students return from their group work, they can discuss their big takeaways as a class you always wanna have some type of activity or a statement that brings and concludes your group work activity. This activity allows you to see that you can have multiple groups working simultaneously to complete a task. Keep in mind, this may not be something that you do the first week of school. You will want to model the expectations of group work and you want to make sure that the students are comfortable with the tools you've chosen to use before asking them to work in groups. Let's pause and do a quick check in. What are the top tips that you heard in this presentation that you plan to implement? Some of the top tips that we discussed are when planning, remember to keep synchronous and asynchronous learning in mind. Have engagement activities for students to limit the passive interaction and include interactive and creative <laughs> opportunities. When possible, collaboration is encouraged between the teacher and the student and amongst the students. Lastly, checking for understanding throughout the session, but always making sure that you are checking with intention at the end. Now that you've seen groupings and samples of groupings and how synchronous and asynchronous activities can be completed in your classroom, let's take a look at some templates. We've assembled some templates here that will be very helpful and know that when you look at this uh, presentation, the links on here will be active for you and you'll be able to get to them. Remember, this is a template toolkit. When you're looking at the, the items that are on here, think about it outside of the box. Think about your needs and how you're going to frame your instruction. Although these items are categorized specifically here, know that you can repurpose them and use them depending on how you want to deliver your instruction. Let's take a look at the first category that is graphic organizers. Here we have a Venn diagram, something that we've used all the time, but we want to take a look at it so you can see what it'll look like when you open it. When you open this document, just like you've seen in other examples we've used earlier, you have the option to open it and use it as a template. So you have a preview here. When you click use as a template, you're able to make your own copy and adjust the columns and the headings that you see here um, for your specific use for instruction. So again, this is one of the templates that you have in your category for graphic organizers. Next, let's take a look at asynchronous activity templates. In that area, Let's take a look at the choice board template. Uh, I'm sorry, the Freyer model template, the Freyer model template for vocabulary. This is a model this way. This one opens in such a way that you have to actually do file and make a copy. You'll notice that you'll have a view only uh, access to it. You'll have to make a copy of the entire presentation. Once you make that copy of the entire presentation, you can edit it to suit the needs of your students. 
You can also repurpose it and add your vocabulary words to it. You can have the students add their, re their vocabulary words. Again, as you're deciding how to use these templates, think about if you're gonna use them asynchronously, if you're going to assign them to individual students or assign them co collaboratively. Our next grouping that we have is the synchronous activity template group. Here, let's take a look at slide snaps, the slide snaps template master. This is a really cool tool here. And again, this is listed as a template. And when you open it as a template, you'll be able to make your own copy of it. And it has specific directions of how this template can be used. Here, it'll give you examples of what your, the images that your students will have to place, the notes that they'll have to take during your session. It also has an area for students to place a recording or a screen recording that they make. Remember that some of the tools that we're using require that students be at least three, three team. Some of the templates we'll be using require that your students be at least 13 years old or older for them to use recordings or to post recordings. So remember that when you're using something like this with your students. And remember, you can repurpose that area and have students place images instead, as long as they're not images of themselves. So that's a quick view of the slide snap master template. Again, on our toolkit, we have a wildcard area. So you've got lots of handouts that you can use different ways there. You also have a really cool tool that is Ms. Hansen's digital library. But one that we want to take a look at is we'd like to look at the novel choice character board. This is something like a choice board that you can create or um, open as an open the template and have students uh, create, uh, complete this activity individually. Again, you would open it, use the template, and then it's an interactive type of activity where they are given specific assignments based on a character in the novel that they're reading. Um, just know that although this is a novel choice character, remember, remember to think outside of the box. You can use an activity like this with other content as well. All right. So again, this provides them opportunities to choose different activities and to create uh, specific items that can be shared. Okay, so again, think outside of the box when you're accessing this template toolkit. Think about how you want to develop your uh, or design your lessons and how you want your students to interact with those templates. Finally, finally, we have some tips, additional tips for asynchronous and synchronous instruction and synchronous activity with your students. First, you want to determine how students will respond when recording. Again, remembering what was mentioned earlier about students' images and likenesses being captured during recordings. So we don't want that image, those, their images and likeness captured. So you have to determine a, determine a way that students will respond to you. Another tip is to allow time to establish routines. So small group meetings and sessions are seamless, just like you are when, you in, when you're in your regular classroom. You have to establish these routines so students know exactly what to do at appointed times. Additionally, you want to set clear expectations during your time with the students. That means during your synchronous learning times, you wanna set those expectations for how students are expected to respond or what students are expected to complete asynchronously. Don't leave it all up to writing notes or giving assignments that are written out. Remember, your synchronous time is when you're really connecting with the students. So do use that time to set those clear expectations of what is expected from the students when they complete their asynchronous activities. 
Next, set expectations about how you'll use certain tools during your synchronous learning sessions. For example, you want to make sure that their microphones are muted or their cameras are on or their cameras are off. Remembering that uh, we're not supposed to be recording sessions that have student likenesses. All right, but you want to make sure that you set clear expectations about how you want students to use tools as you're meeting with them synchronously. And finally, choose tools strategically. Remember, just because we presented you with several tools, you don't have to use them all. And clearly, you don't have to use them all at the same time. So think about your instructional focus and your instructional goals and choose the, the tool that will benefit the students the most. Remember, we're not using technology for technology's sake. We're using technology to help the students connect and interact with the content. So I hope you got a lot of great tips from our session today and have a better understanding of how you can have students interact during synchronous sessions with, uh, with you and when you're uh, developing and delivering your lessons. Uh, you have your technology training team. That's us. We're here to support you um, in all of your endeavors as you're using technology to meet your instructional tools. This uh, webinar and all of our web webinar recordings and other resources can be found at our bit.ly. That's at bit.ly slash T3PGCPS. Remember, when you go to our website, you're going to choose your role. And then if you would like to, you, once you choose your role, you'll see the resources there for each role. Additionally, you'll be able to find out who your T3 support is when you go to the Meet Our Team area. So remember, that's where you can find your resources and T3 is definitely here to help you. Thank you for joining us for our session today.